hello everyone. As Jan already said, my name is Adam Janowski and I'm a, oh, we're one slide ahead. I'm a PhD candidate at the Masaryk University, more specifically at the uh, Center for Research on Cryptography and Security. And in the next 30 minutes or so, I would like to talk about kleptography, which is a sneaky way of creating backdoors. Um, first, uh, we're going to we're going to introduce kleptography. We're going to talk about what it what it actually is in the first place. Uh, then uh, we will we will actually uh, recap on what TLS protocol is, because in the last part of the lecture we are going to. Uh, altogether derive a kleptographic backdoor for the TLS protocol. Uh, during, during the lecture, I'll be talking about how I can break things with kleptography, how I can break the, the TLS protocol as a wall thing. But there's a, there's a huge limitation you should, you should keep in mind, and that is that to mount such an attack, you, you need to have a physical access to the computer. Now, you may be wondering um, why, why, why would I do that? Because when you have physical access to the computer, you have pretty much everything. But uh, we, will, we will see later that it's actually quite strong attack anyway. So we're going to start with a definition. What is kleptography? Uh, kleptography is a study or an art, if you will, of stealing information securely and subliminally from black box cryptographic devices. Now, what does it mean to steal some information securely? That means that the information that is being stolen is somehow encrypted. And I, as an attacker, have, a, have an exclusive, exclusive access to the stolen information. So no one else can access it, only me as the attacker. Uh, you will also notice that during the lecture, I'm going to pose myself to the role of an attacker. That, that's the good thing about the cryptographic research, that you can break things and actually being paid for that. So let's proceed. What does it mean to steal information subliminally? Uh, that means that it's practically impossible to notice that some information is being stolen. Um, we achieve that by by utilizing already existing um, data structure as a channel through which we are going to steal the information. Okay, so we will not create an explicit new channel, but we will rather use an implicit one, already existing channel. And what is a black box cryptographic device? Well, that's put simply, we can think of such devices of a device which internals you cannot easily scrutinize. So, for instance, if you have a Java card that is all, you know, in an epoxide shell, you, you can't really scrutinize what, what's inside. The, the algorithms that are inside, they appear to be working as expected, but they actually may be doing something, something else apart from the cryptographic computations. But if you take, for example, a binary library, then it can be also viewed as a black box device because you know you have to reverse engineer it. You, you have the access to the binary, but you have to reverse engineer it to actually see what's, what's going on inside. And if you are not suspicious, then why would you do that, right? So, well, we will, we will consider binaries to be black box devices as well. Um, further, kleptography is also an old belief that you can steal someone's souls by taking a photograph of him or her uh, we were going to skip this branch completely and we we're going to focus on the, on the first branch. So now a quick questionnaire. Who of you have heard of an RSA crypto system before? Raise your hand. Oh, that's good, that's good. So we don't have to cancel the whole lecture. That's good. Now, who of you have heard about Diffie-Hellman key exchange? Raise your hand. Excellent. So I'm going to start about a backdoored version of uh, RSA crypto system that has a tiny little detail which limits it from being used in a, in a real, real world, but it, uh, it serves as a great educational example. So here we go. This is a, an algorithm to create an RSA keeper that has one step that is modified. Guess which step it is. So let us set up the wall situation first. 
So we've got an Alice uh, who wants to communicate securely with Bob. In order to do so, Alice is going to create an RSA key pair. So what she's going to do is that she's going to generate two large primes and she's going to compute the product of the primes, which we will call N. And you know, she's going to compute some quotient group. It doesn't really matter what it actually is. Now, the second step is modified. And bear in mind that when Alice is creating an RSA key pair, it's not really Alice who is creating the key pair, it's the device she computes with, right? So the device that is backdoored is going to do a little change to the original RSA algorithm. Instead of choosing fixed, constant, public exponent, we're going to, to involve some exponentiation there and we're going to be an attacker who is having this, this public RSA key and instead of um, choosing fixed public exponent, we're going to take a prime and exponentiate it and select this as a public exponent. Now, this is, this is the very step that limits this thing from being used in real time, because, or real world, rather, because it's, it's an easy detection mechanism. When you would see some weird number here, you would say, all right, this is not a legitimate, legitimate RSA keeper. But suppose for a minute that um, the, the public exponent would be picked uh, uniformly, that it would be a random number. Then this would be great because this would also be a random number and it would, be co it would look completely legitimate. Now in the third step, uh, the device is going to compute the private exponent that is uh, very, very private of Alice and serves her for the decryption of the key. And Alice is going to end up using the key pair consisting of the public part and on the, of the private part. So the thing is that if you are the attacker, which, which we in cryptography call such attackers as Eve, then you can easily derive the, the prime from the public exponent. You know, the public exponent is being distributed over the internet because Alice is saying, all right, this is my public key, feel free to encrypt anything with that. So Alice simply eavesdrops the public key and computes the, the private key from it, or one prime, and from the prime she can derive the public private key anyways. So the situation roughly is as follows. This just stopped working, all right it is. So Alice is going to generate her private key on this device, and she's going to advertise the public key to Bob. Suppose that Evil Eve is eavesdropping on the insecure channel, and she's going to catch the public key on the line. So what she can do is she can derive the private key because she, she has the access to the backdoored version, right? So now when Alice wants to send some message that is encrypted to Bob, she's going to do so. Uh, pardon me, Bob is sending an encrypted message to Alice, right? Bob obtained the public key of Alice and he's going to send encrypted message to Alice. So he's doing so and Evil Eve can decrypt the message because she obtained the, the private key. So this is a nice application of kleptography and this practically is a kleptographic backdoor. Um, we will proceed to the very formal definition of uh, what properties does this backdoor have. Uh, the backdoor is also called an asymmetric backdoor because it necessarily or inherently utilizes um, an asymmetric cryptography. So suppose that we've got some original cryptographic algorithm C and we're going to modify it to obtain C, C prime and the modifications will fulfill several, several conditions. So the first, first condition is that uh, the clean version and the infected version have the same input. So you can't tell based on what goes into the algorithm, what is the clean version and what is the infected version. The second condition is that the modified version, the backdoored version, computes efficiently and that it uses some some public key of the attacker somehow. 
we'll see how we'll see how exactly in the in the next 15 minutes or so so the third condition is that the attacker private key is not contained on the backdoor device now this is important because if the private key would be there after reverse engineering the device you would actually have the access to the to the stolen information now we don't want that as the attackers we want us to be the only persons to have the access to the stolen information. And the next condition is that the output of the modified algorithm is the very same as, the, as of the clean algorithm. And at the same time, when you are eavesdropping on the outputs of the modified algorithm, it allows you, it allows the attacker to cryptanalyze it, to break the original algorithm, for instance. All right, so the next, next condition is that you can't efficiently tell apart the outputs of the clean algorithm and of the infected algorithm. And the final condition is that after reverse engineering, an inquirer cannot determine past or future secrets. You may be wondering who an inquirer is. Uh, we've got a kind of schizophrenic situation here because we've got an attacker who is attacking the cryptographic device, but who is attacking it in a way that the, the, uh, his access to the information is, is secured somehow. So the backdoor can be a subject of, cri of crypt analysis on itself. So we will call the person that is attacking the backdoor actually an inquirer. If, if it's not clear, we will get to that later once more, so it's going to be clear in the future. So that's the kleptographic backdoor in a nutshell. Now let's recap how it actually works in a practice. So we've got some attacker. Practically, this is going to be a state agency who is having, that is having uh, sufficient capital to mount this attack uh, that basically supplies the subverted algorithm and somehow hard codes the, the public key into, into the device. Now, the thing is that uh, you can imagine it as, you know, if the state agency has an access to the uh, manufacturer, for instance, through some policies and so on, she can force the manufacturer to, to, to use the subverted algorithm. So this, this is the thing that it can be used uh, it can be used in massive, in massive scales. Now, uh, the Alice is, is not able to inspect the internals of the device. It may be in epoxy or uh, in some hard shell, or it may be just a binary that is difficult to reverse engineer. So she doesn't care as long as the, as the device computes as she expects. Uh, another condition is, yeah, as I already said, that the device is working as expected. So if it's a TLS library, for instance, then we can say that it actually secures the HTTPS connections as, as a clean library, nothing, nothing wrong there. And another thing is that the EVE or the state agency, for instance, can cryptanalyze the output, so can break the, the TLS library to obtain the private information, whatever the private information may be. So uh, when I was conducting the research, I was trying to answer several questions. Uh, the first question was whether such things, such backdoor can be derived for the TLS protocol. Um, the second question was if it can be derived for the TLS protocol, can it actually be implemented or is there any obstacle that prevents the backdoor from being implemented. And the next question was, if it can be implemented, can it be actually efficiently detected or so? So in the next 15 minutes, uh, we're going to say yes to the first two questions and we don't know to the third question. So a very short, very short introduction on TLS. Now, somewhere on this picture, there is a TLS. Here it, uh, here it is. The green lock is a TLS. Uh, so, practically, TLS is a protocol that works 
uh, that is a cornerstone of the today's internet, and it allows, it provides um, confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity of uh, internet sessions, for instance. That means that it uh, encrypts the information that is being transmitted over the internet. It also ensures that the information is not going to be modified along the, along the way. At, and uh, it can also authenticate both client and server, though the server is usually authenticated and client not. Um, by the way, uh, we're going to derive a backdoor for the client, not for the server, but uh, it works practically the same for the server. I will just stick to the client case for, for simplicity. So this thing is not really working as expected. Never mind. Now, a short Diffie-Hellman intermezzo. I'm going to introduce Diffie-Hellman in a way that you probably uh, didn't see it, but I hope it's going to work for us as expected. Now, these little letters are Alice, and these little letters are Bob, if you, if you can't read them. So practically, Diffie-Hellman is a is a protocol how to generate a shared secret, uh, how to establish a, sh a shared secret between two people across, uh, not necessarily people, across insecure channel. So what are they going to do? Now, they are going to somehow, magically, derive some private part of the key and some public part of the key. And each of the, each of the people will going to do the same same thing, but necessarily obtain different numbers. So this is the first step. Now, Alice is going to advertise the, the public part of the key through the insecure channel to Bob. And Bob is going to react, and he's going to advertise his public key over the insecure channel to Alice. Now, so they have private key. Alice is having private key of herself and public key of Bob and Bob is having private key of himself and public key of Alice. The key observation is that both parties can derive the shared secret uh, that is actually private key of Alice and public key of Bob, which is, which is the very same thing as when you use private key of Bob and public key of Alice. So, Efficiently, they ended up with the same numbers just by exchanging some publicly available values, all right? The thing is that you can, you don't necessarily need to use people, you can use devices to exchange the values between themselves, and we're going to utilize this. Now, let's go to the, to the short overview of the TLS handshake. Now, in order to secure the, the TLS session, you, you have to, the server and the client have to communicate somehow at the beginning of the session, and they have to exchange the secrets and establish the cryptographic keys and so on and so on. So this is virtually the, the TLS handshake. In, in the first step, the client is going to initiate the communication to server, and among other fields, the client is going to send some random nonce that is random 32 bytes practically. Now, this nonce will serve us as an ideal channel to exfiltrate some information inside it, because it does not have any, any specific structure, it's just 32 random bytes, and we can change it and let it be another random byte that maybe look perfectly random from, for someone else, but for the attacker, they have some internal structure, okay? Now, the server is going to react, he's going to say hello as well, he's going to say his certificate, so uh, the authenticity is being, is, is achieved, and he's going to say, I'm not sending anything else. Um, basically, here they are going to exchange the keys, maybe the server is, has already sent the key, maybe it didn't, it's not, it's not needed, but client is going to send the key anyway, and the last two steps serve as a confirmation that everything went okay and, and both parties are satisfied with the result. So, in order to modify the, the TLS handshake, I already said that we are going to focus on the, 
on the client's view. So you may notice that we can't, as the attackers, we can't modify any of these messages because these are the messages that are sent by the server. So if we are modifying the client's device, we don't have access to what's going on on the server. We can't modify anything in this, in this handshake that's going on from the server. Now, this message, the change cipher spec, is already encrypted and we can't read it as the attackers that eavesdrop the line. So it's, not, it's of no use to, to try to modify it. Uh, client key exchange is also of not use when trying to modify it for some very complicated reason I'm not going to talk about, but efficiently we're going to end up modifying the, the client hello message. So now if you're falling asleep, now it's time to wake up because on the very next slide, no, not yet, okay. so. If we, go, if we go backwards, uh, I'm going to say that all cryptographic material for the session is, is derived from the master secret. So if you are the attacker and you are eavesdropping the, the wall session, all you need to know to derive the, the keys and to decrypt the wall session is the master secret and some publicly available information that goes in the plain text in the handshake. Now, in turn, the master secret is derived from the pre-master secret. So again, we can reduce it. If you are the attacker, all you need to know about the session is the pre-master secret and some publicly available information, and then you can decrypt the whole session. And pre-master secret is established as a Diffie-Hellman shared secret between the server or client, or it is some random bytes that are generated by the by the client and encrypted by the server's certificate. So there are two methods. It doesn't really matter which one is going to be used. We will break both. So as I already said, the very suitable channel for exfiltrating some information is the client hello nonce because it looks random. So if we take something and encrypt it, it will also look random so we can use it and it will definitely not look suspicious. All right, one more slide. So there were already, there was already some research on, on this thing. There were two proposals. One of them did not fulfill the two conditions, I believe. Yeah, two conditions. Uh, we were talking about how a symmetric backdoor look, looks like, so two conditions were not fulfilled. And the other proposal was really proven to be secure, was very perfect, but it required almost 400 Diffie-Hellman exchanges in order to decrypt a single session. So you can say that this is not really practical because you know it will be easily detected by timing analysis. So we took the first approach and we modified it and got the following result. Yeah, we're getting there. So what you're going to do as the state agency is that you're going to modify the algorithm on all devices you have the access to. You're going to modify them in the following way. You are going to generate your own Diffie-Hellman key pair and you are going to store the public part on all the devices. And you are also going to generate some AES key, but uh, you don't do that actually to encrypt or achieve confidentiality, but only to make things look more random. Because if you encrypt something with AES, it inherently looks perfectly random, or should look perfectly random. And then you also modify the algorithm in the following way. Then that if the handshake is triggered on the infected device, the algorithm, instead of generating random 32 bytes and publishing them in the random client hello nonce, this is what the original algorithm does, it's going to do the following thing. It will generate a fresh Diffie-Hellman key pair and it will compute the shared secret between this key pair, between the public key that is stored perma permanently on the device and using this private part that was just generated for the single handshake. So the algorithm is going to generate this shared secret. Now, 
It will encrypt the secret once more with the AES key. So this actually look perfectly random and we will publish the public key of the Diffie Hellman instead of the client hello random nodes. So the original algorithm published 32 random bytes. The modified algorithm will generate some public Diffie Hellman key, encrypt it so that it looks perfectly random because this is not perfectly random number. It has some internal structure. So we're going to encrypt it once more with the AES and publish it. Now, when the generation of the premaster secret is triggered on the infected device, we will, we will derive it deterministically from the seat, from the seat S. All right, it doesn't matter how, because it's going to work as expected, but we're going to do it this way. Now, what if the state agency is actually listening to, the, to this whole session and knows that the backdoored version of the algorithm was in use? So what they do is they're going to use, they're going to capture the client hello random nonce, right? And they know, okay, this is actually not a completely random number, but it is some public key that is further encrypted with the AES key. Now, we have the AES key, so we're going to decrypt it, and we're going to obtain the public key. Now, we can use our private key that we know that we hard-coded into device in the first place, and we can apply the Diffie-Hellman function on it to obtain the very same secret S the seed that was generated on the device when the handshake was triggered. And from this point on, we can actually replicate the computation of, uh, that was happening on the infected device. And yeah, this is, this is the key observation that uh, the, the seed that was derived on the, on the infected device is the same as the seed that the attacker derives from him, for himself. And at this point, uh, the attacker can derive the, use the seed to derive the keys for the wall session, for the wall TLS session, the very same way the device does. So that means that the attacker can decrypt wall session. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So let's, let's go once more through the properties of, the, of this proposal. As uh, you may notice, it actually computes efficiently. There is no rocket science behind it, and it computes quite fast, as we will see. Uh, on the assumption that AES is a pseudo-random function, uh, the published client hello random nonce in the modified algorithm looks perfectly random, so it can't be dis distinguished from the original nonce, statistically. And also, reverse engineering does not break any of the sessions for anyone else but the, but the attacker, because if you actually reverse engineer the device, you will only get to the public key of the Diffie Hellman. So, and you end up having efficiently two public keys, which is of no use. Now, let's get to the implementation. I selected the OpenSSL library to implement that. Uh, which I managed to do, but I needed to modify the header files. But I, I'm stating here that uh, the whole thing could be done without modifying the header files, which would result into quite nice malware because you could just inject it as a binary, right? And the interface would not be, would not be changed. And let's talk about whether this thing can actually be somehow detected apart from you know, uh, the binary having uh, different hash digest or something like that. So one thing is to detect it by looking at the modified random nonces. Uh, it appears that they are really look perfectly random, so this is a no-go. And I tested that statistically through some statistical batteries and I found no distinguisher, which is kind of an expected result. And further, the whole handshake took 0 0.3 milliseconds um, more time on average than the clean handshake. So if you know something about time analysis, you know that this is a kind of a corner case for detection. It's, it's not reliable because the handshake depends on 
you know, connection over the internet, so there is some latency and so on. So it depends really on the on the powers of the person who who's detecting the back door. So it, it's definitely not reliable to try to detect that through timing analysis. And moreover, there is a huge space for obfuscation, meaning that uh, you can actually pre-compute some values and that then in, you actually uh, are computing the, the infected version like in, a, in an own time. So it's hard to tell whether it can be efficiently detected. Uh, let me let me conclude in the, in the very last minute. So in the beginning, uh, we have taken an original existing backdoor proposal for TLS and we have advanced it and improved the design and uh, rigorously proven the security of it. Uh, further, we have implemented the backdoor into the OpenSSL library. I created a pull request on a GitHub, but it did not pass the internal checks of the OpenSSL. And as a result, the kleptographic backdoor for the TLS is a real thing. I would like to also acknowledge uh, the valuable guidance of Jan Krhoviak and Vasik Matyash who helped me with this thing and we ended up publishing it as a paper that is called Bringing Kleptography to Real World TLS and is going to be soon available on Scholar. And yeah, these are the sources and that's it from me and I would like to, I would love to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Hey, Jan. Uh, was there any real world use case where kleptography, known use case, where kleptography was detected in the wild? Uh, so the question is whether kleptography was already used in the wild, not exactly, not necessarily in TLS. Um, there is, there are rumors that the that the NSA, NSA actually patented a, a random number generator back in, I would, like, I would say like 2005 or so. It's called Dual ECDRBG generator. And uh, it contains, it has basically some structure and it serves to generate random numbers, right? So it also contains two constants that can be arbitrarily in the nature, in its nature, but are set to fixed value in the very case of the NSA. And it also turns out that if they fulfill some very special property, that you can efficiently break the protocol. But you can't tell whether they fulfill it or not, but someone who provided the constants can say that. So my guess is that it, it actually was in use, such a backdoor, and uh, the constant fulfilled the property, so it's actually a backdoor version. But it wasn't in widespread use, but it, it got to, I don't know, it was a default random number generator for some library, but not very widespread one, as far as I know. So either it was too complicated or it was very clear. I think the first place, first thing is, is right. Oh, question, great. Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, the question is whether the attack would be possible if, uh, if Diffie Hellman over elliptic curves would be in use. And the answer is that yes, it, it does not change a thing actually. So yes, that's virtually the answer. It, it doesn't really matter what, uh, whether you use uh, Diffie Hellman over the integers or over the elliptic curves to exchange the, the secrets for the session. Uh, the backdoor will work in, in two cases, in both cases essentially the same way. Thank you. Uh, pardon me? Yes, if you if you will use a finite field for the Diffie-Hellman, the, the backdoor will work as well. Okay. 
So I guess that's it. Thank you.